Hello and welcome to South County Spotlight on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins, back in studio once again. There's an election coming up in November, which will contain a very important state ballot question regarding charter schools. I recently had the chance to cover a Conway School Committee meeting where this issue came up, and I saw a very impressive performance and presentation by Diane Jensen Olszewski. She's a retired Chickabee Public School teacher, a resident of Deerfield, and she joins me in studio to talk about this issue. You're part of a group called Save Our Public Schools. The website, by the way, is saveourpublicschoolsma.com if you want to learn more about this. And, and Diane, you're obviously very passionate about this. I appreciate you making time to come in and talk about it. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Let's talk about the dangers posed by an expansion of charter schools in Massachusetts. What should people be most concerned about with this potential ballot question? Well, if this ballot initiative is passed, it allows for 12 additional schools each year, and that's written into perpetuity. So every year we could add 12 more. We are losing right now $408 million a year to charter schools. And because we don't have a foundation budget that even provides the right funding for the schools anyway, we're already starting from a not good place. Uh, in, at Frontier, they're losing $500,000, for instance. So, um, and the rural communities get hit very hard because they don't have as big a budget or any, any room to, to, to do that. There's no extra money they can find somewhere. And a lot of unfunded mandates like regional school transportation. Exactly. Um, so that's part of the issue. The, uh, the other issue is that we don't have a lot of accountability typically from many of the charter schools. Most of them, over 60% of them, have corporate style boards that don't have a parent representative and uh, so that's problematic because there's no local control and there's no uh, overseeing of where the funds go. Many of the schools will, they have to keep kids until October 1st if those children return to the public schools, they can keep the money for that year. So that's a, another issue. Uh, they don't typically service and haven't serviced special needs children, English language learners, or any early childhood ages. Uh, what I did in my job as a public school teacher was work in an integrated preschool, so we took children at age three that had a, a variety of uh, special needs. So they don't have to service that population. They can basically cherry pick. They and, can. And even though they say they draw lots, the truth of the matter is they can take whatever students they want. They have a lottery system, but we don't, it's not transparent, right. so we don't really know who they take or why. Um, but we do know that in a lot of the inner city charters, and there's been much written on this, they have a very punitive system where if there is a child that's struggling or has any behavioral or mental health issue, they can find an easy way to demerit that child out, sometimes for minor infractions like their uniform not being the yeah. co correct. So I feel passionate about it because, I, I, first of all, I worked in early childhood, so one of the things we don't have money to fund right now is full day kindergarten right. across the state. So we have a whole bunch of students coming in that aren't on a level playing field as it is. Charters can pick and choose how many children they're taking in each grade and which grades they're enrolling in. So, uh, and I feel like my son's school, he went to Deerfield and Frontier, there are things that he missed out on because other schools are separate and unequal. Uh, our state auditor, Suzanne Bump, in January sent a letter to the Joint Committee on Education addressing the fact that we don't, we shouldn't expand charters right now because we don't have adequate data, enough data, it's not being collected in appropriate ways that tell you anything significant that you could base any decision making on. And it's a pretty strident letter, so I included that in all the packets that I hand out when I speak to people, as well as a, a packet that talks about how much each district is losing to charter schools and what, what that means in terms of your district. Did you lose a librarian, some paraprofessionals, you know, some kind of technology that you absolutely need to have and so it's, you know, it's near and dear to my heart having worked in public education for so long. Now the concept of choice and charter I think was well intentioned. It was, the idea was to give teachers, or give parents basically options if they didn't feel like the district that their kid was in was doing what they needed it to do for that child. 
Unfortunately, like so many government programs, it starts with the best of intentions and it's not exactly implemented the best way possible. And in, in, the, in the case of, of, of charter schools, what you have is a setup where essentially public money is funding private schools. And part of the thing I think that you brought up that I was very intrigued by was, you know, when this whole system was set up, the idea was charter schools and regular edu ed districts would work together and collaborate and share information, and that just flat out hasn't happened. Right, and the original idea, concept, of charter schools was created by Albert Shanker, who was president of the American Federation of Teachers. And his concept was very different from this. It was, it was creating these satellites where teachers, teachers could be empowered to do innovative things and they were still certified teachers. They were sometimes the top teachers in their building. They could go off and they had a lot of leadership skills and they could create these innovative programs and then they would bring them back to share with their district and other district. That has not happened. There's, there's, there's no transparency from the charters. There's no communication with the public schools. And in fact, when we attempt to get records through the Public Informa Freedom of Information Act, we've had to have People have had to sue to get the records. So there have been several cases across the Commonwealth where that has happened. And having worked in a public school, I can't imagine my principal or my superintendent refusing to turn over documents that the Department of Education has asked for. It just wouldn't happen. So um, I think the idea, the original idea, you know, could have been a great idea, but what happened is it got hijacked by millionaires and billionaires essentially who are the ones funding this ballot initiative. There are many groups behind it, uh, the Walton Foundation, Freedom Works. The Cokes. <clears throat> the Cokes. It's a coalition of conservative, and there's actually a book that's been published, a booklet that talks about the threat to our public education. Now, playing devil's advocate for a second, mm -hmm. um, one of the arguments in favor of this is that you've got kids in urban districts that are going into basically a social meat grinder. That people feel that kids in, that go into these urban districts are going into schools that are not only substandard, but they're sometimes dangerous. And that the charter option gives these parents a chance to take their kids out of that potentially toxic environment and put them into a school that might serve their needs better. And that may be true for urban areas, but out here in rural Massachusetts, that's not the case. I mean, there are some charter schools, not as many as in, in urban areas, but it seems like in rural regional school districts, which will be hit the hardest by this because the most money will come out of their budgets. They're operating on a shoestring now. I mean, right. is there any way to, to get that message across that why can't this bill, if you're going to expand charters, put them in areas that need them the most, not necessarily in rural districts? Well, actually, in this initiative, there is a plan to not only allow charters into level four schools, which are schools that are deemed failing or in trouble right. by the state, um, but to let them, you know, to swing the door open, to let them come to a lot of communities that by and large so far have not experienced this phenomenon. And they tend to be wealthier communities, preferred right. districts, frontiers of preferred districts. So one of the points Frontiers Superintendent Marty Barrett makes repeatedly is that you know, she's feeling the pinch in the budget so badly from this, and they're a preferred district. So, you know, they're still, they're still compensated in some ways by other things. But in a place that's, you know, already struggling, it's, it's, it's just going to be impossible to maintain the level of public education that we have. And in fact, if we fully funded our public schools first, which is what Stan Rosenberg's latest piece of legislation that he tried to, he got it through the Senate, but it's, it's none dead, of us feel there, that it's yeah, going right. to pass through the House. Uh, it made a lot of, uh, it talked a lot about funding public education, you know, with a formula that's valid, because we have an old formula from 1993. And nothing's going to change until that formula gets updated. I mean, the, the foundation right. formula, it's just, <clears> it's, it's so off. And some of these formulas they use to, to figure out the school choice dollars is it just arcane is not even a word to describe it. Yes. And I, you know, as a, as a well-educated teacher who did lots of practicums and spent lots of time in classrooms before I even became a teacher, 
it, it's really worrisome to me that they can hire non-certified teachers and people that are from Teach for America, which it's a great deal if you're from Teach for America to have some of your college loans be paid for. However, someone that has done five weeks for Teach for America is not equal to a veteran teacher that's certified. You know, I, I, there's just no comparison. You're, it's apples and oranges. And I, I will submit to you, I didn't go to a charter school, but I went to a private school for four years in middle school. Mm -hmm. I went to Eagle Brook School in Deerfield. I don't think all of my teachers were certified, but I can tell you that there was not a single class where I had more than 10 kids mm -hmm. in the class. Now, the way private schools operate are different because they're, they're completely outside their own public education. When you throw something like mandates like testing in, when you tie funding to testing, I mean, what role does testing play in, in making it difficult for public schools to educate rather than just teach to a test? Well, uh, I mean, it's just reducing the amount of time that you have to teach to do test prep. And in fact, the charters, some of them spend over 50 days a year doing test prep and testing. So in 180 some odd school days, that's a significant amount of time that you're not actually teaching and in the teachable moment. And all of us remember those moments in classrooms when someone asked a question that was thought provoking. And if you don't have time and you have to do a scripted lesson plan, that you can't respond to a student coming to the learning situation, which is what Dewey talked about, right? That right. the teacher can teach, but the learner has to want to be there. Correct. And those are the moments that keep students involved. Those are the teachers we all remember. Yes. That they had time to do that. And it's being limited. And, and there are kids that are coming in to the public schools that have many disadvantages. I mean, poverty is a significant problem. It wasn't in all the schools that I, I worked in. I mean, I, I did home visits on my job, so I walked into every housing project and tenement in Chicopee. And I know that I have parents with no resources to get their child to a charter school. Many of them didn't even have a car. They took public right. transportation to grocery shop. So that's not a level playing field when the school is physically inaccessible. I, I take care of three kids who go to a charter school and there are many days when a taxi cab picks up and drops off students. So I know that for the families I worked with, they certainly wouldn't have that in their budget. I mean, that would be their food money or their rent money, so. What drives me nuts about the argument is that a lot of the proponents that are pushing for a, a question like this have never spent any time in a school. Or in a and, public and, school. And, and, and I, thought, <laughs> I, I thought I knew a lot about it because I have a, a, a sister who is a superintendent, we talk a lot about this frustration, but it wasn't until I had took time to actually substitute teach in a mm -hmm. school and I saw the, the, the one, the, the pair is working with the real severe special needs kids. It gives you an entirely new perspective on what public schools face. It is a, not an easy job. And you talk about siphoning a hundred million dollars more out of the system. Yeah. I mean, it's terrifying and, and, and you don't know how hard those people work until you go in and you see, and you saw it every day as a teacher. I did, so I and, and you. I got to sub after I retired in this district, in, in Waitley, Deerfield, and uh, Sunderland. And I have to say that I, you don't get, often get release time to do that when you're an active teacher. And I saw extraordinary lessons and just teachers dealing with very complicated behaviors in the classroom, special needs, all kinds of issues that are going on at home with students and still manage, managing to do an excellent job and present all of the things that are in the curriculum well. And I, you know, that nearly brought me to tears someday, days because I feel that <clears throat> The, the general public has demonized teachers in many ways, and they don't understand what it's like to be in a classroom and how many balls you have to keep up in the air. And buying your own supplies. And, yeah, oh, you know, yeah. I, mean, I spent at least $1,000 a year in my classroom, and that, that was for 35 years, so you can do the math. <laughs> but as somebody who's been in the classroom and, has, and, and is in this fraternity that is so important, it, it's got to make you really angry to hear people like the governor come out and say, we have to... We have to approve this charter school uh, reform question because our schools are substandard and, and the amount of work the teachers put in. I, just, I, I couldn't imagine being in a profession being demonized on so many corners when you, all you're trying to do is the most important work you can do, which is, to, is to, to educate kids. Yeah, well, we're demonized and then we're told at the beginning of every school year how valuable we are and how 
much we contribute to society, and then that ends after that opening day, usually. <laughs> so, you know, as teachers, we're used to that. We, we, we're not doing the job to make money or for any other reason except that we love to do what we do. Uh, otherwise, who would stay? Because every day there's a new mandate from the state. There's some new federal mandate that we have to adhere to. And, you know, we, we just kind of learn to deal with it. But I think if we could adequately fund our public schools, many of these issues that you're talking about would be, you know, eradicated, basically. We, we need more staff. We need highly trained people. We need to let teachers innovate. Let them be teachers, exactly. You know. And we don't do that now. We have a very top-down management style where, for instance, we had a meeting with Desi about a variety of issues relating to PARC. Which yes, is, which is a new standardized test that right. focuses a lot on technology that not is not totally available in all schools. Right. Yeah. And Pizer is on the board of PARC. I oh, have yeah, the document from John Galvin's <laughs> office that shows you that. So, you know, it's just we're stuck in an endless cycle of underfunding the public schools and then blaming them that they can't adequately meet the needs of kids. I want to ask you one other question, plain devil's advocate, because one of the arguments you always hear when people argue that we need to increase the number of charter schools, increase the options, is that the reason public education is underfunded is because of teachers' contracts, because of the teachers' union, that the teachers' union is the bad guy, that, that because you know, they demand a certain number of step increases every year, forgetting the fact that teachers probably, in comparison to what they do for what they do and how important it is, are, are woefully underpaid as it is, but it's easy to point a finger at the unions and say, that's the bad guy. How do you respond to that? Well, I, in all the places where there are strong teachers' unions, there are very good public schools. In places that are right-to-work states, which is essentially right-to-bust unions, their schools are not good in most cases, unless you're living in a gated community in a metropolitan area of the South, for instance, where it's a different world than it is when you drive through the rural South. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's part of the unequalness of this whole thing. We're creating these so-called satellites of excellence, and there's no data to show that they do anything even close to what the public schools do. We take everyone. Exactly. Every year it's a different situation in your classroom with the kinds of needs that you have, and you have to adapt on week one and go with it. And I, I don't think enough legislators even understand what teachers do. And in fact, one educator recently said to me they should make a reality show that puts legislators in the classroom for three days. Be, you know, that wouldn't be bad. I wouldn't have a, I would like to produce a show like that. <laughs> because I don't think that, I mean, I don't think they see how much teachers have eyes in the back of their head and their, their kids are coming in and out to services and they're teaching a lesson and they get interrupted and there's just a, a multitude of things going on. But, but we, we have a big problem in a lot of the urban districts of, of poverty, and poverty is a huge issue that is outside the realm of teachers curing by themselves. Correct. But education is the great equalizer. Yes. Without free quality access to equal public education, we don't have a smart electorate, and no one has a chance that's already starting off way down here. I mean, you know, when I look at a, a boy I tutored in Chicopee in high school, and what limited resources he had. I mean, he, he was living in a house with no heat in the winter, and he had no lamp, no maps, no dictionary, no computer. And then I come home to my son, who has all of these resources and is in a school where he's supported. And, you know, it's just not a level playing field at all. So we, we have a, a lot of issues to address in terms of income inequality that affect education as well. But this is such a primary civil rights issue to me. I see it very much like the Jim Crow South, that no one today is going to raise their hand and say, I'm for the Jim Crow South. That sounds like a great system. Because it's so obviously separate and unequal. And that's the same as this. It's obviously separate and unequal. And you mentioned the, the, the stress that exists in the schools. I mean, I, I look at 
for example, police departments are no longer just about catching bad guys. There are many social service agencies. Same thing with the schools. Right. You've got kids coming in that not only are dealing with poverty, but are dealing with coming from a household where parents have largely abdicated the responsibility of parenting. And so they, this kid gets dropped off at the schools and whatever behavioral baggage he's bringing from home, right. he brings into the school and you guys are not trained to deal with that. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it I've had parents and I've in seen jail, it. I've seen it first domestic hand. violence. Yeah, horrible. I've walked in on drug deals for home visits. I mean, I've seen it all. But, you know, the one thing I do know is that I am not a divine being that's a predictor of how every student will do. And I've, I've really learned that. I've had kids in my class that were born at 26 weeks. And they were sort of counted out by the, by the pediatrician at birth. And uh, I, they do amazingly well with early intervention, right? They, they end up saving the Commonwealth a lot of money because they get a lot of activities and enrichment in, in those early years. And then many of them go on to be in regular education with very few services or none. So that is a kind of seven to one bang for your buck, the early childhood component. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but you know, we're talking about choice and charter, you know, the kids that come in to a district in kindergarten tend to stay all the way through. Right. Whereas districts that don't have that, you know, the kid may bomb out or may leave you know, or you know, whatever, or and districts that can offer a pre-K program are more likely to attract choice dollars rather than, and right. choice is a whole separate I issue. I mean, if you ask thing. public school teachers in Holyoke or Springfield or even Chicopee, do you have the same kids all the way through? The kids that are in struggling families move around a lot. Right. They can't find housing. We had 75 homeless kids outside of Chicopee High School every morning at one point. So. Uh, you know, these are the sort of invisible kids that a lot of people are not seeing, and certainly I don't think the governor sees them. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so either, and, and that's why I, I, I feel like whenever we talk about this, I, I feel so bad for the people that go to work every day and have to deal with this system and are constantly told, you're not good enough. Mm. We have to have another alternative because even though we're not funding you properly, we're not going to necessarily try to fund you properly. We're just going to basically complain that you don't know what you're doing. And That's it's, exactly right. It's an awful thing. That's feeling. what's happening let, in Holyoke let, right let, now. Let's talk about your organization, Save Our Public Schools. Now, you've been going around trying to get local resolutions from all these different school committees. And there's a big map and all over the Commonwealth. You recently spoke in front of Conway and Frontier School Committees. And I'm sure... And Deerfield. And, and Deerfield. And I know that they had, they, they, you have their support. But what is the strategy? It's a, it's a short hop between now and November. Yeah, how, do you, how do you get out there and tell this story without seeming like you're whining about not having enough money? I mean, is it, is it tough to, to go out and campaign in favor of public education as it exists now? It's not tough for me. We just did some canvassing last weekend, and it was in Northampton, granted, a, a very education-minded yes. community with a, with a great coalition of parents that already exists there. But... It was very positive. The doors that we were able to access, folks, we got a very positive response. People wanted buttons. They wanted to sign up on commitment cards. It's, it's very easy for me to do this, knock on doors and talk about an issue that is dear to me, that I care about profoundly. It's like working for a candidate that you really love, lo love yeah. like canvassing for someone who you really believe in. and. You know, you don't have to know all of the answers when you canvass, but you have to know your story and why you think this is an important story. Um, we are going to do everything we can. We're going to have phone banking. We're going to do canvassing. We're going to wear our buttons wherever we go, hopefully to start a conversation in grocery stores at the dump. I'm trying to get a table at the farmer's market in Greenfield, so we'll staff that on Saturday morning till about 1.00. Uh, with different folks every week. We're putting the word out any way we can. We, this, this group is a coalition of groups, so it's Mass Teachers Association, Jobs with Justice, uh, Mass Education Justice Alliance, and many other parents, educators, students are, are part of this broad coalition. So Let me ask you a tactical question when it comes, because like I said, the, the election is not that far off. Is the strategy to campaign against the question or to campaign in favor of the system? In other words, are you going out there saying, this question's evil because of A, B, C, D, or are you going out there saying, you should vote against this question because the system's okay right now. I mean, we're doing well. We just need more money. We need more resources. Well, we say both, actually. Um, and a lot of the talking points on the paper that you have, uh, you know, speak to those same things. 
Uh, we talk about how much money districts are losing. We talk about what services your child's school might be losing. We talk about the lack of accountability for where the taxpayers' dollars are going in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which to me is a bipartisan issue. Every person that pays taxes, whether you have someone in a public school or not, should care about that, right. should want accountability from our government. And we don't have that right now. And when we try to get it, we have to have a lawsuit in order to get the record. So, you know, that's really troublesome. We, we also have a, a ballot initiative that's written so that it's 12 schools in the first year. And that sounds like a small number. It sounds so benign. But when you, t when you think about the amount of money that we lose from 12 schools, and in 10 years, that could be 120 schools. In many of the places in this nation where these kinds of initiatives have passed, the entire system has become privatized. Oh, really? And coincidentally, this group is not fighting for the Horace Mann public schools right. that and have so that's, local yeah. control and public accountability factors. They have completely left those off because the folks that are running this ballot initiative are hedge fund billionaires and millionaires, essentially, that are trying to privatize public education. And if you watch any business show on the news, you'll see the education sector is being talked about as a money-making thing. Yeah. So why is that? That's standardized testing. And standardized testing, by the way, we don't have any evidence to show that that's a predictor of how kids will do later on in their job or in college. The single biggest predictor in college is your zip code and your parents' level of education. So not the MCAS and, and not the SAT. But you have to have the MCAS to even graduate high school. Only the 10th grade. Only MCAS. the 10th grade, exactly. And but but if you don't pass by the 10th grade, you don't get a diploma. Right. And, and you don't even get out of first year. Although I have talked, I've interviewed a college that, professor on this show, and we talked about um, students that come in, and a lot of times the kids that come in don't have some of the basic skills. I think in part because they're so focused on testing, they aren't being taught the stuff they need to be able to learn to be able right. to, to go into college ready. And a, and a big part of teaching is relationship building with <clears throat> your students. And if you're on a script and your administrator wants to see you on the same script on the same day as the teacher next door and you have a different makeup of, of kids in your class or you know any kind of circumstance, kids living in trauma, domestic violence, poverty, there's just, I've seen it all. So I, I've had those kids and I know that you have to stop and figure out different strategies to make all students feel welcome and valuable. And you don't have time to do that when you're being constrained by this ridiculous system, I think. I mean, teachers have always been accountability, accountable. We give tests, we collect data. I had portfolios on all my young children with their uh, samples of their work and you know, anecdotal evidence of what they were able to do that I did many times a year. So I could, I could sit down and take any child from my class and talk to a parent or an administrator about how that child was doing without even having to look at my notes because you're just in it doing it all the time. And that's true of all good teachers. And I, I don't think that, that the general public understand that that, that, that that is occurring in classrooms all over our commonwealth. Well, you have a few months to make them understand it. If someone wants to get involved, is watching this, how do they get involved with your effort? They can go to the website. There's a, uh, ways to sign up uh, to fill out a commitment card. They can go to massteacher.org, which is the Massachusetts Teachers Association website. There are many things you can access on that website not being a member. One of them is the issues and actions section. If you click on that, you can see all the issues that we work on that affect public education. And this, of course, has moved to the very top because it's such a, a bottom line issue. If we don't stop this cap from being lifted, it's the beginning of the end of public schools. They will, they will be bleeding money every year, and more and more will be siphoned off. And, and then they'll be demonized for underperforming, and they won't be staffed well. Programs will be lost. Uh, and you know, in New Orleans, this happened. It's happened in Los Angeles. I I don't want to see it happen here, and I I'm going to work every day until November on this issue. So we're just we're going out into the community in any way we can to uh, just talk, have a conversation. And this isn't about demonizing parents who send their kids to charter schools. This is about all of us wanting our child to have access to 
a free, quality public education. And, and it's not that way. If we lift the cap, it'll, it'll just decimate the public schools. The website is saveourpublicschoolsma.com. My guest has been Diane Jensen Olszewski, retired teacher from Chicopee and resident of Deerfield. That's South County Spotlight. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.